My name is Laura Amman, and together with uh, my colleague Aziza Hamel, we curated this exhibition that goes by the title Do Nothing, Feel Everything. The title was actually borrowed by a tampon advertisement, uh, which read exactly the opposite, namely, uh, do everything, feel nothing. Uh, and for us, this promise of numbness uh, felt very symptomatic for the current times, where we're kind of not allowed to really fully process what happens because one crisis comes uh, chasing the other. And what we wanted to propose or explore are uh, art practices that perhaps permitted or proposed uh, a different time and uh, space frame that would us allow actually to uh, do nothing but feel everything. There are different strands in the exhibition that are, um, I think, quite closely interwoven, but it's uh, perhaps good to mention them. Uh, the one important point for us was the relation of madness uh, to art history, so this uh, very romanticized idea of the uh, mad genius that uh, comes along uh, in art history. And, but then actually uh, more contemporary uh, issues regarding mental health, uh, where we have to finally, perhaps also precipitated by this pandemic, um, admit or agree that actually our mental health or our mental well-being is actually not a personal matter, but very much a societal one that is shared uh, by each and every one of us. And meaning that um, if we are not there to take care of others, we are failing others. And it's not our personal, um, let's say, failure uh, if we're not doing well. And in terms of uh, more, mm, let's say, theoretic uh, ideas that were behind uh, our thinking and um, conceptualizing of the exhibition, there was uh, these very interesting notions for us uh, regarding uh, reparative uh, and depressive reading, which were very interesting for us. And I think lots of the artworks uh, function in a way uh, that wants to be uh, reparative. And through uh, Eve uh, Kozowski, we actually also came upon the theories of Melanie Klein, who was uh, perhaps the most uh, important, uh, let's say, rival to Sigmund Freud and Anna Freud uh, regarding um, psychoanalysis uh, in children, because actually Sigmund Freud thought that it's not really possible to do psychoanalysis with children, but um, Melanie Klein came up um, with a play uh, or toys that functioned in a similar way uh, to Freud's um, walk, uh, talking therapy. Uh, but what actually interested us the most was uh, Melanie Klein's um, concept that throughout childhood we repeatedly go through uh, two phases, one that is uh, the depressive one and one that is the schizoid one, but we actually need both uh, to grow and to uh, reach, let's say, next uh, important developmental steps, but we're always oscillating between, between the two of them as opposed to Freud's ideas where there is one phase after the other, and only if we complete one, we get to the next. Um, and I think this, can, this is also something perhaps that is vi very visible in the uh, exhibition, that we were very interested also in this ambiguity that a lot of works show, that uh, they actually also oscillate, perhaps even between um, contradictory ideas, uh, but that are uh, um, in the way that we want to understand um, madness, insanity, paranoia, depress depression, actually um, simply other forms of thinking and of being uh, and of knowledge coexisting. And so I think that there are uh, many different threads actually that go through the exhibition and I would like uh, to perhaps go through two of them. Um, and one uh, important aspect for us was the idea of uh, healing and of mourning and uh, I would like to talk about three artworks in relation to this. Um, the first one is by Chilean artist uh, Patricia Dominguez, who actually, uh, in this installation by the title Green Irises, brings together two things that perhaps at first sight might seem um, contradictory, namely ancestral um, knowledge and uh, technology uh, and corporate lifestyle. And she kind of creates this altar where we see a lot of offerings um, which are relating to plants that are said to 
be able to actually uh, counteract the effects of our corporate or capitalist life. Uh, for example, the Rose of Jericho, which is supposed to um, neutralize Wi-Fi uh, signals, or uh, aloe vera, which can soothe our eyes um, when we have to sit uh, all day in front of the screen. And what we also see is actually uh, the, two, the two green irises that also give the title to the installation, which are scans from Patricia Dominguez's uh, iris herself. And uh, through this element, she also wants to ex express her own uh, legacy and her own DNA and also the colonial legacy that is, of course, uh, also part of uh, Chilean culture. The items that are around uh, that we see constitute sort of totems. Um, there are prints on shirts um, that, of course, the shirts represent very much the corporate lifestyle um, that she tries to uh, counteract and heal. And one, yeah, one of the important aspects for us, or interesting aspects, was to think also uh, about these topics in relation to uh, technology and to the digital in general. The second work um, that I find quite interesting and also very much uh, interrelated to this um, is by artist Shana Moulton, and it's called The Pink Tower. Um, Shannon Moulton has been working with an alter ego uh, that goes by the name of Cynthia already for a long time, and there is a whole body of work uh, related to Cynthia. Uh, and this character uh, is actually, um, well, she tries to, through all sorts of um, self-improvement and self-healing items, um, to find meaning and spirituality uh, in an otherwise um, yeah, very <laughs> harsh uh, and brutal uh, capitalist life. So she tries bubble baths, healing stones, uh, reflexology, but actually at the end she always just spirals back uh, into an abyss. Um, and in this uh, specific um, installation, Shana Moulton also plays uh, with these cubes that are very well known from um, alternative schools. Um, and um, it's also related actually to the town where this uh, work was conceptualized, namely Santa Barbara. So it, it relates to the idea or to the story of San the saint, uh, Santa Barbara, who is said to have been uh, captured in a tower. And she also refers uh, not only to the saint Santa Barbara, but also to other fairy tales such as Rapunzel and uh, of women that are basically cast away. And the third work that I want to talk about uh, in relation to healing and mourning is by artist Tony Cox. Um, and Tony Cox um, is known for a sort of very, yeah, very powerful mm, yet minimal installations, if you will. Uh, he works very prominently with text, um, text that is presented to us in color schemes that often refer to modernism, and with very atmospheric uh, music arrangements. So he kind of turns upside down our ways uh, of, uh, of understanding and uh, of the reception, let's say, of visual material. And he creates very uh, yeah, strongly emotional response to his work with this. And the specific work that we uh, chose for this exhibition is actually a eulogy to Mark Fisher that was given um, at Goldsmiths by uh, Kodwo Eshun. And for us, it felt very important to rep have uh, such a figure as Mark Fisher represented in the exhibition because, of course, um, he was not only uh, sort of the midwife to so many um, movements, uh, all kinds of feminisms and futurisms uh, and accelerationisms, uh, that he has such a cultural relevance to us, but at the same time he also very often spoke about uh, the brutal effects of capitalism on uh, our uh, lives. And he himself was uh, very much afflicted by severe depression and uh, which also cost him his life. But uh, the work of Tony Cox actually ends on a, I think, very encouraging note, uh, namely, um, it is actually a call, let's say, 
to keep thinking actually with and through um, the many legacies that Mark Fisher left us and the many, uh, let's say, unfinished projects that he left us to uh, evolve, evolve and um, develop in our own ways. While this is, uh, I think, the smallest uh, work that we have in the exhibition, I think it is a very uh, impactful one. Uh, it is by Henry Joseph Darger, who um, lived until the early 70s, and his work was actually only discovered uh, very few weeks before his death. So he never really got to see um, the legacy of his work. Um, and yeah, the very um, actually impressive course that it took. Uh, Henry Joseph Darger left uh, 15,000 pages of typewritten text, which describe uh, a very uh, yeah, magnificent epic, let's say, and over 300 illustrations that go along uh, with the text. Um, and in this text, Henry Darger actually describes the adventures of seven girls, the seven Vivian girls, who are uh, Christian princesses of their dominion, but who are actually in peril uh, because of other forces that want to uh, enslave all the children. And the story shows, it's also again this very strong ambiguity. Uh, it shows a lot of very beautiful, blissful, um, fantastic scenes and the girls in adorable dresses. But then on the other hand, we have very brutal um, scenes of battle and of violence and of murder where these uh, cute uh, little girls are actually killed by the dozens. And in this uh, picture that we have here in the exhibition, you can also see this ambiguity. You have these very adorable girls in their Victorian dresses, but they all actually uh, look at us, stare at us just through black holes, so without eyes. Uh, and another oddity actually in Darga's work uh, was that he depicted the girls very often uh, naked and with uh, actually with male genitalia. But for us, it's of course, we can only guess uh, what all of these things meant uh, since his work was only discovered upon his death. But it's perhaps also very interesting and important to um, say that Darga himself had actually a very um, yeah, very complicated life. His mother died when he was four years old. Uh, his father had to be put in a mission home when he was eight years old. And uh, starting th from them, Darga was actually also in the system. He had to go to a home of uh, children, of feeble-minded children, for not having his heart in the right place, which meant that he was a regular masturbator. And as an adult, he started working as a janitor um, in similar institutions. He was a very devout Catholic. He went to mass five times a day. And uh, he had only, he was, uh, yeah, he was very reclusive and he only had one lifelong friend, um, which is uh, rumored to have been actually his lover. So you can imagine uh, that someone um, growing up in this environment uh, strictly Catholic, um, probably had a lot of, let's say, yeah, um, contradictions to content and to um, try to synthesize in, in his life that perhaps were also the reason to escape into this fantasy world. And what is also, I think, quite interesting to mention, uh, since we don't really, since it's hard to interpret many of the questions that Darger gives us, he actually uh, left us with two endings. Uh, to the story, one where the Vivian girls um, lose the battle against evil and one where they uh, are triumphant against the evil forces. The relation between the mental health and the systemic violence and the, um, and, um, the structural violence is, and the economic violence is really something that we for us, like, was very important to to somehow be able to point at and to acknowledge, and also um, I think it was also due to this moment of uh, pandemic as well to insist on the fact that this um, condition was a common condition. 
I mean, be it the mentally challenged one or the physically challenged one. And that it's a moment to somehow talk about it and acknowledge it and, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think a term that we kind of came across uh, several times uh, in our research was this idea no, of the double, the double injury of capitalism so that uh, you are not only uh, made sick by uh, the capitalist demands on our lives, but then you are also supposed to feel guilty about it mm -hmm. uh, because you cannot function, you're not productive uh, and you're depressed and unhappy on top of it all. Yes, and also kind of thinking as well about all these mechanisms of exclusion, mm -hmm. like be it within, of course, like the health uh, care system or just, you know, what it means to be like functioning or what it means to be normal, what it means to work, what it means to um, be able to exhibit, what it means to be able to access. So all these ideas as well of access, of ability, these abilities, they were all things that were following us uh, through through this and also I think also just on a kind of more personal note it was we were also so much surrounded by this this moment of like deep exhaustion and deep mm. despair that it was very important to find ways to articulate it somehow mm. and I mean this is just an art exhibition but it still was important to find a way to talk about it yeah yeah and in relation to that it's perhaps uh, also good to underline you know that when we speak about healing and soothing um, that we're actually not interested in kind of returning to a normative idea of functioning and yeah. being productive but that we actually want to look at forms of coping and of uh, bearing but from a yeah, mm -hmm. non yeah. normative perspective yeah. exactly and also like just to mention again jacob jacobson uh, uh, hospital of self-medication mm -hmm. which made this like beautiful poster and then he was there was a one paragraph of, about recovery that was for me like so uh, important because he says that we don't want to recover which mm -hmm. is uh because the recovery just means like a coming back to to normality and 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 just kind of uh, again like start over in order to kind of like be exhausted again and um, yeah. So these are all basically attempts to open dialogues and conversations around this, but also to be able to express them as well personally, like for the sake yeah. of us but also for the sake of our colleagues and for the people around us and um, yeah.